Cheers, guys. Epics 911, welcome to the Gaming Friday edition of VR Roundup. This is episode number four, the date, Friday, October 27th, 2017. Great show in store for you guys tonight. Let's just touch on a couple of things quickly. If you haven't been to the channel for a few weeks, this is the VR Roundup series. It's going to be on a schedule every week, every Tuesday and Friday. It's the news slash current event show. There's also the VR A to Z show, which is going to have a bit more of a random schedule. And it is everything from the history of VR to tutorials, tips, tricks, purchasing, configuration, really cool VR centric topics and all points in between. Basically, if it's VR related and it's worth more than just a quick mention, we're probably going to cover it at some point. Took a break from the historicals. Episode number three is a revisit to the Halifax VR Arcade. If you haven't seen it yet, check it out, guys. I thought it was just a really, really cool location. Excited about just the direction of VR arcades in general, especially the smaller ones like this. And then, of course, the quick looks. They are going to be back with a vengeance starting Monday. Can't wait to show you guys the new format for those. I think you'll like it. All right, guys. Let's start this uh, show off today with uh, some fantasy. Really, no holds barred, money, absolutely no object type fantasy. When it comes to products, products have their mecca. If it's movies, the mecca, Hollywood. If it's technology geeks, Silicon Valley comes to mind, but that's a location. It's probably Tokyo's Akihabara that really kind of exemplifies the tech geek culture. Well, for arcades, which I'm also into as a hobby, Fun Spot, which is part museum and part mega arcade, easily the mecca for that. Well, what if I gave you as much, you know, money wasn't an object. You could have as much as you wanted. And I said, build me your version of virtual realities mecca. What would you come up with? Think about that one for a second. What would your imagination provide me? Well, take a look at uh, this little build happening over in China. This is the East Valley of Science and Fantasy. It is a massive 1.3 square kilometer, that's 320 acres of theme park. It's being developed by a company called Oriental Times Media Corps. Specifically, their animation division, which is located in Guangzhou province, as is this park. The budget for this project, $1.5 billion. Yes, billion US. The site is going to include 13 pavilions, and it aims to give people who visit the park an unforgettable virtual reality experience. As you enter paying your ticket, you're going to be provided with a head-mounted display that's part of the entry gear. The park itself, guys, check this out. Right out of a science fiction movie or the kind of, you know, artistic sci-fi cityscape rendering that you could download as digital high-res wallpaper. This massive Transformer-style mech guarding over the park, 750 tons <laughs> That is a metric crap ton of steel used for this. 750,000 kilograms of steel. The weight of two Boeing 747s. It stands about 174 feet. That's 53 meters in height. First wing of this park is going to open up this December. The park is going to feature VR roller coasters. VR fantasy and sci-fi rides that are going to see you doing everything from slaying dragons to fighting spaceships among the stars. And a large portion of the park is going to be devoted to research and development, as well as making virtual reality media. That's films, shows, experiences, etc. Guys, safe to say, this is now on my bucket list, right up there with Akihabara, which we mentioned earlier, and a bunch of other places. Cannot wait to see what unfolds here at this park. 
I've been pretty tough on the various virtual reality companies when it comes to marketing. I don't think the marketing campaigns have been that inspired or that effective. However, on the sales side of the equation, things have been looking a lot better, especially in 2017. The folks over at Oculus, their summer of Rift sale, really seeing the price get slashed nicely. Likewise, HTC, while they haven't had as many sales, they've been equally aggressive. Both bundles have a pretty nice discount as of how things sit right now. However, HTC coming out swinging, making their bundle look a little bit more attractive. What they're doing now is they're throwing in a GTX 1070, bringing that bundle price back up to $799, but that represents about a $200 savings. Performance-wise, yeah, it's not as powerful as the 1070 Ti. It sits in about fourth behind the 1080s and the 1070 Ti. But all in all, this bundle, not a bad deal, especially if you were sitting on the fence because you had an older graphic card. Maybe it's a 960, maybe it's a 970. This is definitely an upgrade to those. And until the next generation comes out, you're going to be in pretty good stead. Also, the bundle includes the pre-order for Fallout 4 and until the end of October. So Halloween also is going to include Bridge Crew. Next up, being half German, I grew up watching some pretty bizarro world TV guys. And I used to marvel at some of the strangeness that you could see on German TV. So... Um Ungefähr vor 4000 Jahren landete eine Gruppe von Raumfahrern irgendwo im Gebiet des östlichen Mittelmeers. Tja, das muss für die einfachen Menschen damals ein ungeheurer Eindruck gewesen sein. Sie mussten sie für Götter halten. Especially when I was living in Holland uh, as a teenager, I went back to live with the old man and there was a German show called Tutti Frutti. Well, we're not going to get into too much. Google it if you want. But um, it was strange. Very strange. Itself based on an Italian show. And then years later, when I thought, you know, the Europeans were kind of the masters of bizarro world television, because trust me, there's some strange stuff out there. Well, Exidy introduced me to Japanese media. Of course, the Splattergore films I talked about. But also, they're really, really strange game shows. Now, in a lot of areas like this, it's not so important if this sort of stuff is successful in Japan. Whereas for other things that Japan is really known for, it's much more important. Manga, anime as an example, or Japanese games if this is a game that you want greenlit for localization outside of Japan. If we want a game to have a chance of that it generally has to do well domestically in Japan. And of course, that's only part of the battle because as we know, a lot of gems, really good gems did well in Japan and still never saw the light of day elsewhere, which is a shame, but it still has to usually pass that first hurdle. What about something like VR? Well, considering Sony is, you know, one of the premier Japanese companies, you would at least hope just as an example, that virtual reality in Japan, especially a Japanese brand of virtual reality, would do well. And while the Japanese sales were okay for the PlayStation VR, around 200,000 lifetime units, they could have been a lot better. Well, that may be reaching a turning point. So the new model of the PlayStation VR was just launched in Japan beginning of October, October 9th to the 15th. We've got some figures of how many units between October 9th and 15th, 27,000 PlayStation VR units were sold in Japan. It's roughly 12% of lifetime Japanese sales. Not bad, not bad at all. And just as an aside, I talked about the Pimax in the last episode and where it was on Kickstarter. Not necessary to do another full story on it. I just wanted to mention, if you were having some concerns about the Steam running out with virtual reality because of some of the negative stories out there and the positive ones not enough to kind of, you know, get your spirit lifted, Pimax is doing pretty good. And in a climate where you think there would be a lot of virtual reality fatigue, they have surpassed now officially 
Oculus, the DK1's initial Kickstarter, which is fantastic. And still about a week to go on that to do even better. Next up, one of my favorite songs as a teen, Master of Puppets by Metallica. It's from an album that still gets a ton of playtime, depending on my mood. Well, Upload VR commenting uh, in their article with their opening line that HTC Vive's position track controllers and peripherals have uses that stretch beyond VR itself. And we've come a long way technologically when it comes to the progression from hand or string puppets right through to robotics. And yet we are just breaking through to the potential, especially the potential future of VR and what VR holds in store for robotics. Now, personally, I believe remote controlled light mechanized robots they're going to be the future for everything from rescue to warfare to exploration and basically all points in between. If you let your imagination go a little bit, I can see mechs remote controlled on Mars by either astronauts orbiting the planet or nearby in a dome or some kind of, you know, protective environment doing a lot of the dangerous surface field work remotely via these type of robots. Well, scientists from the University of Tokyo are promoting a method of remote mechanized style robotics they say is their most advanced method yet. So earlier systems that they had focalized or focused rather on localized movement, say just the upper torso or just arms or just legs. This newest method that they have involves using the Vive tracking technology and they are remote controlling the entire body, like, well, like a puppet master. Now, there's still many limitations. For example, all the movements are pretty much at walking speed and that kind of pace. They're not very fast. You certainly couldn't sprint or do jumping jacks yet, but it's definitely moving in that direction. Their current robot, they're calling it Jackson or Jackson, J-A-X-O-N. It's the successor to a bot that they competed with in DARPA's robotic challenge. That's a competition to test bots in disaster scenarios. So rescue operations, et cetera, hurricane, those types of scenarios. Very cool. About six weeks back, we touched on Crytek and Oculus working together in some videos talking about different methods of virtual reality locomotion. Well, at the recent Connect4 event, Oculus put out a video with eight different methods that are now featured as part of the software development kit, the SDK. And some of it, yeah, it makes sense when they describe it. However, other stuff probably needs to be experienced to kind of get what they're meaning. There's example code, but you really need to get in there as a developer and test this stuff, field test it with your own Rift to really get an idea of what some of these pretty innovative VR locomotion techniques are all about. Either way, really exciting, especially when it comes to VR motion sickness. I know I've said before, and I still maintain, it is a method for people who get motion sickness, but come on, they deserve more than just teleportation. Surely we can crack the VR motion sickness in different ways so that it doesn't have to be just a tired excuse. Well, it's there for people with VR motion sickness because I'm sure those of you who have that, you don't want to just rely on teleportation forever, right? So definitely a light at the end of the tunnel, hopefully not a freaking freight train, bringing us some relief in the locomotion department or rather bringing you guys some relief. Well, guys, that is it for the Gaming Friday edition of VR Roundup, episode number four. Guys, have a fantastic game in Friday and a kick-arse weekend to boot. Cheers.